history of the Iowa State Memorial Union is a chronicle of Iowa State people rallying around a great idea. Well into the 1920s, the campus lacked a central meeting place. There were academic, administrative, and farm buildings, but there was not a good place for students and faculty to gather for cultural, entertainment, or social events. After World War I, Iowa Staters began discussing the need for a memorial to their friends and colleagues who had lost their lives in the conflict. A bronze plaque was suggested, and a gateway arch. But an outspoken group lobbied for what they called a living memorial that would be included in a building. The student newspaper took up the cause, devoting a lot of editorial space to building student interest. The effort was spearheaded by the editor, F.M. Russell. He supported the idea of a special building that would serve the college and preserve the memory of those who were lost. A request to the state legislature produced little interest and no money for the project. But the students did not allow themselves to be deterred by this setback. In 1920, students began fundraising for a memorial union. Rallies like this one stimulated interest and student organizers asked their peers for a $100 pledge, translating to over $2,000 today. The pitch was emotional. Referring to their fallen friends, this was the line. They gave their lives. You can give $100. Initial pledges came from students. Then the faculty, staff, and alumni were asked to help. With this teamwork, the fund grew considerably. Organizers eventually realized the only way the campus center could be built was by organizing as an entity that could finance and operate a facility. In those times of conservative fiscal management, state departments were not allowed to borrow or bond for capital improvements. But a not-for-profit corporation could, and so, on March 14, 1922, the Memorial Union became a private corporation, enabling it to do business in a way that the college at that time could not. With the full support of the college president and a promise from the State Board of Education to provide a site and some operational support, the project reached a new level of seriousness. Here's the group that signed the Articles of Incorporation. In the group that day was Harold Pride, the corporation's secretary who became the union's first director. He was a World War I veteran and would serve again during World War II. He retired from the Memorial Union in 1959, but remained active in union affairs until his death in 1988 at age 93. The Colonel Pride Veterans Lounge is named for him. The first architect hired by the board failed to come up with a satisfactory design. A second architect resigned. The plan was finally undertaken by the renowned Des Moines firm of Proudfoot, Rawson and Sowers, a firm well known for buildings across the state and still alive today as Brooks, Borg and Skiles. At Iowa State, Proudfoot also designed Beardshire and Curtis Halls. By the time the firm took on the union project, William Proudfoot was advanced in years and not well. The design was assigned to a younger architect, but the right solution was elusive. Proudfoot eventually stepped back in to create the classic design that combined the very large and very small rooms the college wanted. It was to be his last effort. He did not live to see the project completed. By 1925, a million dollars had been pledged to the Memorial Union project. The state board agreed to the site that had been selected, five acres near Lake Laverne. This view from across the lake shows the old veterinary hospital that was torn down to make way for new construction. Early in 1927, with a portion of the pledges in hand, construction plans were made, bids were taken, and the groundbreaking ceremony was scheduled. But discovery of a legal complication provided hair-raising delays at this critical stage. Although the Board of Education had agreed to provide the site, they never formally transferred title. 
and no financial institution would loan money to an organization that did not have clear title to the land. Pride made a trip to Des Moines. While studying Board of Education rules, he discovered an obscure passage that allowed for them to dispose of land. The state attorney general agreed it was legal. The governor was tentative, but approved the deal, finally convinced that he, quote, had nothing to fear about approving a sale of land to a corporation that promised to put on it a million dollars worth of improvements to be used by college men and women, unquote. Three months of intense legal maneuvering followed, bringing approvals down to the wire. With the title in hand and assurance of a loan, the Union Corporation signed the construction contract on the fender of the steam shovel on the day of groundbreaking. That was April 26, 1927. Adding to the drama of the day were ceremonial cannon blasts from a 75 millimeter gun, no one quite realized that the percussion shocks would break the windows of the Collegiate Presbyterian Church three blocks away. By August 1927, the steel framework rose from the knoll of the hill and the whole campus rang with the sound of riveting. In this view from the north, the Bedford limestone facade takes shape. The Memorial Union was to match Beardshire, McKay, and Curtis Halls, creating the fourth compass point around Central Campus. In October 1927, interior work on the stairway at the west entrance proceeded, creating an elegant entry in which no two steps are alike and only one is straight. When it was completed, Gold Star Hall created a long corridor entrance to the original building. Gold Star Hall is the memorial in the Memorial Union. In World War I, when a family had a son or daughter in the service, they displayed a sign with a simple blue star in their window. When a life was lost, the sign with the blue star was changed to one with a gold star. Hence the name, Gold Star Hall. The names of Iowa Staters who died in World War I were initially carved into the walls. Since then, names from World War II, Korea, Vietnam, Somalia, and Iraq have been added. The grand opening of the Memorial Union was on September 23, 1928. The building was barely finished, but opened to serve a campus population of 4,000 students. The building housed cafeteria service and one floor of guest rooms. There was also a beauty shop with the services expected by women of the day. And there was a well-staffed barber shop. The building housed business and alumni offices as well as this lounge that we now call West Lounge. In September 1928, the lawn was incomplete and patrons had to enter on a boardwalk. However, the campus community center was finally open. The fountain was added in 1937, a gift of the Visha Committee. In 1942, sculptures by Christian Peterson were donated. Four figures of Indian women represent the four seasons. In the mid-1930s, students led a drive to add more ballroom space and for the first time pledged their activity fees to help with the project. In 1938, construction began on what would be the first of 11 additions to the original building. In that first addition was more space in the Commons and the South Ballroom, which was the new southernmost space. In the basement of that addition were the first six bowling lanes, Actually, it was the bowling lanes that dictated the size and shape of the addition. In 1943, Gold Star Hall received its finishing touch. Replacing clear glass were 12 colorful stained glass windows designed by Harold Cummings, an Iowa State graduate. Each window represents a human virtue, such as faith, tolerance, love, and determination shown here. 
There are also images depicting Iowa State legends and landmarks, areas of study, and branches of the military. After World War II, enrollment at Iowa State jumped to nearly 10,000. The whole complexion of the campus changed when former GIs who were married and older than average filled the ranks of students. This slide shows married student housing in Pamel Court. But all over Iowa State, facilities stretched to meet demand, and the union was no exception. In 1948, a small addition went on to the south and southeast, allowing for expansion of the kitchen and providing space for eight more bowling lanes under a new south terrace. Then, starting in 1950, the most dramatic of the Union's additions took place, the Northwest Wing and the terraces. On the third floor, this construction created the gallery and offices. On second floor was the main lounge, just across from the main desk. The area we now call the Pride Veterans Lounge was originally the women's lounge. That's why there's just a women's room in that space. There was also a men's lounge in the northwest corner of the second floor. On the ground level under the terrace was a new billiards room near the bowling alleys. That space is now occupied by Dean of Students offices such as Greek Affairs. Before this addition, the west door exited directly onto the lawn. After the addition,